Hey everyone, Brian Von Vier here, back at it again. It's your number one voice actor and narrator from Ohio. How's everybody doing? Make sure to get some water and some snackies handy because we've got another doozy. Today we've got Homebrew DMs. What was your most interesting and or favorite monster that you've made or used in a campaign? Part 1. It required a lot of behind-the-scenes roles, but there was a dungeon I ran in a superhero 5th edition homebrew where the final enemy had the ability to generate horrifying illusions throughout the entire dungeon that were capable of hurting you via psychic hoodoo. I.e., it burns you, you have real burns on your body. I collected the player's whiz saves in secret and rolled them every time they entered a room. Sometimes everyone saw the monsters and fought hard, other times the room was totally safe but the best was when only one or two players saw it. One time, they just thought they couldn't see the monster, and the one player took a ton of damage trying to mark it with paint so the other's attacks wouldn't miss. He missed with the paint, and an obvious giveaway failed. This kept happening until they reached the end and killed the supervillain and the spoopy fog vanished, and they found notes on studying the psychic hoodoo. They seemed to dig it. Cherubim, or Nightmare Dragons as most folk call them, are fairy dragons that have been stripped of all magic by being in the abyss for so long. Over time, they slowly become purely animalistic and were stripped of their wings. Since they have no magic, they train and solely rely on their physical prowess and uncanny speed. They start off as small hatchlings, but at this stage, they never venture far from other hatchlings, staying together as a hive. Once they reach a certain age, they leave and start hunting by themselves. Fighting one fully grown cherubim on its own is bad enough, but what's worse is if you try to attack a hatchling, it will send out a distress call that will cause other hatchlings to help it. This results in a literal sea of collective cherubim hatchlings which will leave no trace of even the most powerful of adventurers. And if you want worse, try a hive mind. These are female cherubim that watch over the hatchlings using a psychic link. If the hive mind senses that any nearby hatchlings are in danger, they will join the fray and coordinate the hatchlings into an even more giant and deadlier storm of hatchlings. I'm talking tornado-like. The Blood Moon King the final form of one of my big bad evil guys, who was already a powerful homebrew of mine that combined elements of a werewolf and hellhound. They attained it after completing a ritual using a special gem, permanently turning them into a more viscous threat. The actual ritual was intended to render him immortal and invulnerable. Luckily, the team were able to interrupt the ritual before it was completed, so he has not become completely immortal yet. Unfortunately, even with the ritual only halfway done, he still reaps some of the benefits. Having access to powerful melee attacks augmented by necrotic energy, a vampire-like bite that can drain health, a minor healing factor, and a powerful breath weapon called the Hell Flare that deals a combination of necrotic and fire damage. But his most terrifying aspect is his sheer defensive capability. He either resists or is flat immune to every damage type in the game, with two exceptions dealing normal damage. Now the team has to find a way to shut down that ungodly defense before they fight him again. A paper-slash-book dragon known as the Guardian of the Library of the List City of Angkir. It was a construct dragon that would assemble itself from the books and papers in the library when someone without permission entered it. It had a paper breath weapon that did slashing damage and would steal knowledge, proficiencies, language, spells, etc. on a failed wisdom save. You could regain the knowledge or get new knowledge from its body once slain as it would stay dead until the next dawn, at which he would reform. But how does the dragon actually deal with late fees? That's what I want to know. The Wyvern. My players started to steamroll through all my monsters and seemed to get a bit bored. Before this, a player killed nine bugbears on the first turn. How? So I had them come across some people that were kicked out of the capital due to the someone being able to control dragon-like creatures' invasion. When they attempted to talk to the people, they noticed a wyvern. They didn't think it would be a problem, so they started shooting off some weak cantrips at it. Then it swooped down and stung the wizard, knocking him out and then grabbed the ranger. The warlock got a couple of shots at the wyvern before it flew up and dropped the ranger. Luckily, he survived and was woken up by the warlock. After some time, they killed it, but barely survived. 
it got them straight as they knew they were going against dragons, so the wyverns scared them into taking it more seriously. Until they steamrolled a gold dragon by chucking it in a ravine that led to hell. After that, I love the wyvern and I really want to use it again. Well, I used the stats of already existing monsters, but when I was making my first ever one shot, I went with the end of the world scenario. So you would find a lot of cultists there, few mimics, and a demon that would give you something good in exchange for 50 gold. My party somehow managed to scare it away with a roll of 19 on intimidation. But for some reason, at one point of making this, I was like, what about geese? Oh no. So it just happened that players would not only encounter counter cultists and mimics, but also angry geese, hellish doves, and you could also encounter one of three unicorns, each with different personality, and each could give you something cool in exchange for 10 gold. The final boss was a really strong cultist with my homebrew ability, Judgment of the Gods, which meant that he could slap one player with a magical hand. There was also an optional boss, which was a huge hellish goose that was summoned by the cultist to gain its power in order to destroy the whole world. After the cultist was defeated, the goose god of hell became a docile chonky goose. Luckily, my players didn't attack it. Instead, they started petting it. Aww. In the end, they learned that this giant chonky goose was a pet of the gods of this realm. She was named Penelope. What a weird thing it was. But in the end, one of our players, who is a more experienced DM, got a massive mind blow when I've explained what was really going on. I have one that I nicknamed the Endgame Starter, and I can't wait to use it. The Engine of Destruction. By the time of the homebrew campaign they appear and there are only six inert ones, buried and frozen in the Arctic, so they can't be reactivated. The plan for this is that the big bad evil guy, against all possibilities, manages to find one and reactivate it by putting an artificial fire elemental into it. First off, these things are 120 feet long, covered in metal that has no openings. Their belly stands 20 feet above the ground with six legs that end in stumps that allow it to crawl up sheer vertical cliffs. It doesn't have a mouth, only a spiky opening that is filled with blades acting as teeth, and it can use magic. Its movement speed is a measly 20 feet in combat and cannot swim both due to the weight and the fact that it takes drowning damage when submerged. But it can use fireball, breathe fire, and use a 10 foot wide beam of fire that can go up to 120 feet away from the mouth. It's weak to water only and heals when struck by fire magic. The cherry on this cake is its fire aura ability. Its metallic skin burns at 200 degrees Fahrenheit, burning anything that touches it, that catches fire or below that mark, and instantly vaporizes water, even if it's frozen ice. It does 1d4 burning damage when touching it or any steam it creates, making it even harder to approach. Not that it matters thanks to it being resistant to physical attacks and its natural 19 AC. Edit. Change the size back to 120 feet because 150 feet is too long for the top down I drew of it. I also neglected a couple of details. Detail number one. It has a 30 foot tail that can make a bludgeoning attack against any poor creatures behind it. Detail number two. Submerging its <clears throat> head turns off its fire aura ability and makes it take drowning damage instantly until the head is no longer underwater. So I do homebrew enemies for my campaign because I don't get CR and my favorite monsters I made was a six-headed snake-like being. It begins with five of the heads, each head roll separate initiative, but they have the same stats and same hit points in AC. Each head has different things they do. One head makes the person roll a whiz save DC 16. If they fail, they gain the frightened condition, but it can't attack. Another heals 1d8 per turn. A third one has no actions, but can use their reaction to increase their AC. Then two heads have the same ability to attack, but they both do different damage. One is fire and the other is cold. It a two hit roll and if hits, does 2d12 plus dex damage. When they kill it for the first time, it gets a new head and everything is boosted and you roll a new initiative for it and it has an attack and a dex save, DC 18, the to hit take 1d6 turns to charge up. If it hits, if it hits, deals 9d6 of damage and the saving throw of fail, 10d4 plus 10. If you all want to use, I did not truly make any stats, so if you want to use this, you can make up stats. 
My homebrew campaign is based on purely of robots, and my players are quite the interesting group of robots. For my first Dungeons & Dragons campaign, I had a monster plus big bad evil guy called the Amalgamation. This thing was 30 feet tall and 120 feet long and consisted mostly of different robot parts. It was extremely intelligent and used different robot parts in an effort to expand its lifespan. However, it was killing innocent robots for these extra parts. Why he's considered my favorite is because of not his battle style, but rather his manipulation. Now, he has a charisma of six, given he's an ugly big thing, but his wisdom is extremely high. I believe it was around 19 to 20. I have dropped many hints that this guy was a force to not be reckoned with. But lo and behold, my players fell into his guilt trips. To all my fellow players, when the big bad evil guy is monologuing, kill them on sight, first impressions are everything. Now, when it came to battling him, oh boy, this guy was a gargantuan whose body consisted of five tokens in total. I used roll 20 for all my sessions. Now, he wasn't some god or impossible to beat. He was tanky and had a lot of advantages in melee, but was useless in range. In the end, my players managed to kill him, though some almost died in the process. Probably the coolest villain slash monster I ever made, and I hope one day to maybe bring him back in a future campaign. I created corn methods based on the corn from Dr. Weird, the shorts before Aqua Teen Hunger Force, for a Dr. Weird themed one shot. Gentlemen, behold, corn! Uh, who are you talking to, Dr. Weird? Shut the f up, Steve! <clears throat> anyway, key features include exploding into popcorn and the ability to group up and carry away targets. Edit. Stat block and additional info and context below. If this makes it into a video, don't feel obliged to read the whole thing. You test me, sir. Or ma'am. Corn methods. Corn methods are my own version of the many elemental based methods. However, unlike other methods, corn methods look like ordinary corn when stationary. If your players ever go near a farm, have a handful of corn methods pop up. They will never treat corn the same way ever again. Any ear of corn at any time can turn on you, and the reason you shouldn't tell secrets is because the corn has ears. And methods. These would make a fun help a farmer kind of quest, but because of how widely traded crops like corn would, they can show up anywhere, anytime, even while in town. At level 2, I wouldn't put more than 3 against the party at once. Corn method. Small elemental, chaotic evil, stats. AC 11, HP 21, 6D6, Speed 30, Fly 30, Strength 13, Dexterity 7, Con 10, Int 12, Wiz 9, and Charisma 11. Athletics plus 3, Stealth plus 2. Vulnerable to fire damage and bite attacks. <laughs> Immune to cold, poison, and the poison condition. Dark Vision 60 feet. Languages Cornin. Combat Rating Half, 100 experience. Abilities, death burst. When a corn method dies, it explodes in a burst of piping hot popcorn. Each creature within five feet of it must make a DC 10 dex save, taking 1D fire damage on a failed save and half as much on a success. This explosion leaves behind one day's worth rations of popcorn if collected. False appearance. While a corn method remains motionless, it's indistinguishable from an ordinary ear of corn. Pack tactics. You have advantage on attack rolls against a creature if at least one of your allies is within five Five feet of the creature and the ally isn't incapacitated. Actions. Claws, melee weapon attack, plus three to hit, reach five feet, deals 1d4 plus one slashing damage, plus 1d4 fire damage. Carry away. The corn method makes a grapple check against a target. It has advantage on this check if it's under the effects of pack tactics. On a success, the target is grappled. Take 1d4 fire damage. Until the grapple ends, the corn method can repeat this damage as a bonus action each turn the grapple continues. A method can carry up to 75 pounds, with multiple corn methods able to pull their carry power and use their reactions to move when one corn method also grabbing the same target moves to move as a group. I really like this monster. Hey everyone, Brian here checking in after the vid. Make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and to ring that bell so you can get notifications on any time we upload or go live. Do you want to submit a story for us to read here on a stream? Make sure to check us out on our subreddit r slash Mr. Ripper and toss one in there. Be sure to also follow us on Twitter and Twitch. Links are in the description below. Using a help action? Come say hi to me, Brian Von Vier, over on YouTube as well, where I voice your D&D characters, make memes, and stream games.
I get a lot of messages on Twitter with people saying how much they like my voice and how much my ending messages mean to so many of you. And I want to say thank you for all the love that y'all give me, and I truly hope from the bottom of my heart that you're all doing okay. I want each of you to have friends, to know you're loved and worth the life you live. Things can be hard, yeah, but hey, at the end of the day, we're all in this together, and don't you ever forget that. All the love, everybody, be safe out there, and I will see you next time. Bye for now.